Hello and welcome to The Intentional Clinician. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, Licensed Professional Counselor. In today's episode, I'm going to be talking to Dr. Nicole Kane. And let me just tell you a little bit about Dr. Kane before we get started. Dr. Nicole Kane is the only naturopathic doctor that also has a master's in clinical psychology who has a particular expertise in alternative treatments for bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Dr. Kane works in an integrative office that is comprised of naturopathic physicians and counselors to provide holistic mental health care. Dr. Kane works closely in particular with the clinicians at Health for Life Grand Rapids. And also she has an office in Scottsdale, Arizona, where we are right now. Dr. Kane has a master's degree in clinical psychology with a counseling specialization and is a licensed board certified naturopathic physician in the state of Arizona. She specializes in the treatment of bipolar trauma, postpartum depression, anxiety, and behavioral disorders in children, including ADHD. I also know that Dr. Kane can treat other things, which we're going to be talking about pretty soon as well. Dr. Kane is a member of the Michigan Naturopathic Association, and she has served on the board of directors for the Arizona Naturopathic Medical, Medical Association. She is a contributing writer for Naturopathic Doctor News and Review, Women's Lifestyle Magazine in Grand Rapids, and has served as clinical and didactic faculty at the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Kane. I'm so happy to be here. So, we uh, have you on the show, first time ever, Mm -hmm. and what our listeners might not know is how we know each other. (laughs) I was wondering if you're going to mention that. (laughs) Just coming right out the gate. Yep. So this could be a disclaimer or I don't know what you'd call it, but we are married legally. (laughs) Yes, legally, we are married. We actually met in counseling school. That's true. We did meet in counseling school in Chicago, Illinois. Yeah, there were like 60 women and four guys. So your odds were good and I I got the best guy, I'd say. I'm glad you said that. (laughs) (laughs) So the listeners might want to know what the topic of today's show is, but I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, we're going to talk about Dr. Kane's most recent book, which is an ebook, and it's called Gut Psychology. I'm so happy to have you on the show, and I just wanted to start out before I ask you a lot of questions uh, with reading a little bit about the book, just to kind of give the listeners an idea why I would have you on the show and why this book is important to the fields of psychology and counseling, and also medicine in general. Awesome. After over a decade of research in the mental health field, it has become more and more clear to me that a healthy diet is the foundation of a healthy mind and body. Throughout my experience as a counselor and then as a physician specializing in the natural treatments of psychiatric illness, I have found that there are three key factors in mental health wellness, biological, psychological, and social. This can be described as the biopsychosocial model of health, if I could talk. (laughs) So... I like this next part where it says, traditionally, the mental health community is focused on counseling and prescription medications and treatment of patients who struggle with mental health concerns. While these approaches have been incredibly beneficial for thousands upon thousands of people, there are inherent limitations. Counseling, for example, can effectively address a person's psychological state and sometimes someone's social environment, but it does not treat one's own physiology. Pharmacological medications can address the physiological imbalances, but they do not get to the root of why a person is psychologically or physiologically, excuse me, out of balance to begin with. Moreover, each medication has the risks of negative reactions and side effects. They are also typically prescribed for a long time and does not move the patient to a curative state. And there's so much more in here about the paradigm and philosophy about why you wrote this book, but I wanted to just maybe have you talk a little bit about why you wrote this book and why it's important. While you were talking about that, I thought it might be kind of neat to share what what was the factor that had me switch from counseling to pursuing my medical degree. And that's exactly what is rooted in the gut psychology program. And so you know this story, but your listeners might not. And so I was working in a rehab in Chicago. And so I had uh, young adults who were addicted to substances like cocaine and heroin, marijuana, alcohol, and different things. And my role as a counselor was to lead group therapy and to do some individual counseling. And so it was incredibly valuable because we were able to connect with the emotional soul experience of the patients and to try to identify 
uh, sociological variables, family dynamics, identity, and impulse control, all of those really important things. But there was a, a changing moment for me. And so it was one night when we were in group therapy, and group therapy was typically after they did their IOP all day or after school. And so it was probably like seven or eight o'clock in the evening. I'm up in the north suburbs of Chicago. And uh, my kids were pounding back monster drinks and Red Bull, mm-hmm. as you know, it's highly caffeinated. And one of the patients, one of the kids was complaining of difficulty sleeping and insomnia. And we had to make a referral to a psychiatrist. I, I wanted to say, well, maybe maybe you could just cut back on the caffeine. Right. But that's out of scope. Really? Did someone tell you that was out of scope? Yeah, yeah. My oh supervisor my is like, you, like that's for a doctor. You can't talk about diet. You can't talk about lifestyle. You can't talk about medications. We have to refer them. Mm. And so that kid went and got a sleeping aid. And so you have this developing brain that's on uppers and downers. And it's like the whole Judy Garland phenomenon. And it just broke my heart. And I remember going into my office and I got on the computer and started just kind of typing wishful thinking and I that's when I found naturopathic medicine and so my passion started in the understanding that while doing the counseling is important that there could be obstacles to cure and in this case I believe that that patient's obstacle to cure of her anxiety her insomnia in a part was due to her diet and what she was what she was the choices she was making And so the gut psychology program, I didn't write it until many years later, but it's been really important to me to understand that um, and how that can help us have even better clinical outcomes with our Mm -hmm. patients. Yes. So kind of more a a holistic approach, um, not just working on the mind and to make better habits, hopefully, but also just being able to give the education and also different things from a naturopathic perspective that uh, would be good for the patient. And just for our listeners, I had a question real quick. Can you tell us what is a naturopathic doctor for those who don't know what that is? Oh, thank you for asking that question. Uh, there's, It's interesting. So a naturopathic physician, uh, traditionally they go back hundreds of years, but it wasn't until more recently that we had an actual legal designation as a distinct system of medicine. And so you have... MDs, DOs, and naturopathic physicians are NDs, or in the state of Arizona, it's an NMD. Mm, okay. Our curriculum includes all of the basic sciences, the ologies, uh, pharmacology, uh, human anatomy, all of the same coursework that your standard MD or DO receives. In addition to that, we get hundreds and hundreds of hours in the naturopathic modalities, for example, botanical medicine, hydrotherapy, homeopathy, acupuncture, minor surgery. And so all of that is embodied together in a naturopathic degree. And so in the state of Arizona, where I went to medical school, I am licensed. Uh, It's federally accredited. We have continuing education requirements. And um, I have the licensure rights to prescribe medications, order blood work, diagnosis. But fundamentally, what makes it different is that we look at the root cause and we try to help the person move into a state of better health, and we see symptoms as an indication of an imbalance, and we try to go to that imbalance, similar to counseling, really, hmm, okay. to go to that imbalance and treat the cause, and then this, ideally the person enjoys true remission and gets better, and so that's, that's what naturopathic medicine is. Okay, I have a question, an example, but just before we get into that, so you guys have the same uh, basic uh, curriculum as a DO or an MD, Mm -hmm. and then the specialization and then after that you get all of this other material from a naturopathic perspective and um i was also curious um there's a lot of other states that license naturopathic doctors do you know like what kind of the number is on that more than 22 states offer licensure and the scope of practice will vary by state and so the other states in the United States that don't have licensure, there are in some states, for example, Michigan, there are naturopaths there. And there's a big difference between a naturopathic physician who went to a federally accredited medical school. Four year medical school. Uh-huh. Also people did residencies. Okay. Exactly. Versus what do you, what's a nat? I've heard, because I've heard people say the term, I went to a naturopath 
and uh-huh. that may not be a doctor. That Let may not be a doctor. Is. Yeah, so the difference is that they may have gone to a weekend certification course that isn't federally accredited, that there are no objective requirements for completion. In fact, some people do a couple weekend classes and then they, they hang their shingle and call themselves a doctor. And so in states like Michigan where the word doctor isn't protected, anybody can call themselves that. And so when you're looking for a naturopathic physician, it's important to to be sure that they actually went to an accredited medical school. And, and there's okay. And so yet you can see that by going to naturopathic.org. Oh, that was my next question. Okay. Yeah, to learn more about that. But I mean, we have medical doctors. We have naturopathic physicians in Australia and Canada and um, the United States and other countries. So it's not just uh, an American designation. Okay, excellent. Yes. And Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I'm glad that you pointed that out because it can be kind of confusing that some people call themselves naturopaths. But I guess with licensure pending, apparently in a bunch of states, that is going to be, they might have to figure out a different name Mm -hmm. because that's a little confusing for... Me and other listeners, probably. So, um, glad you talked to us about that. And so, I wanted to get into the book, but um, first I have to say, I was, you know, when I first heard about this gut-brain thing, I think there was a Guardian article or The Atlantic with Dr. Greenblatt, MD, I believe. He was sort of leading a charge and saying that he, I remember the article, he was talking about how he had treated this young lady with millions of probiotics and some sort of possibly fecal implant, some other different things, diet and lifestyle, and this person who had extreme OCD, was a, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, was able to get out of that along with psychotherapy. So can you explain a little bit about maybe the, this gut psychology, what does this even mean, and how is this linked with Dr. Greenblatt, um, MD, and his stuff? That's a beautiful question. Actually, I got I had the opportunity to see Dr. Greenblatt at the IMMH, the Integrative Medicine for Mental Health Conference, he's uh, the physician at Great Plains Labs, and they're doing a lot of really great innovative work um, in the just general wellness and the field of counseling, psychiatry, psychology, so it's pretty cool. And so what he's doing is he's helping support organic acid testing and different sort of diagnostic tools to try to understand what's going on in the gut. And so what we have in the gut is it's called the enteric nervous system or the ENT. And the enteric nervous system is comprised of a lot of different connections. And so we could use the analogy of roads that take information from the gut and then that will give the information to the brain. And so... And one question. Uh Uh-huh. So just for our listeners who aren't a doctor like myself, um, I was reading in here about the how did you say it? Enteric nervous, nervous system. Enteric nervous system. Mm-hmm. And you said something about 100 million neurons in our gut, which is interesting to me because I had mostly traditionally heard of neurons being in the brain. Mm-hmm. And so how do these signals from the gut get to the brain? Mm-hmm. What, what are they traveling on? Yep. So the enteric nervous system has, um, they, they're synaptic connections that communicate between the gut and the central nervous system. Oh, so they're going up nerve pathways. Yep. Okay. Yep. And so the the way the enteric nervous system is firing is going to communicate directly to your central nervous system, which is your brain and spinal cord. And then that will give information to the brain and spinal cord about how to produce its neurotransmitters and neurotransmitters being like serotonin, dopamine, GABA, epinephrine, norepinephrine, etc. And so with the enteric nervous system, the way that that is functioning is contingent upon the status or the health of the gut. In fact, research has shown that upwards of 95% of your serotonin is produced and lives in your gut. And so... Oh my goodness. Okay. I'd heard something about that. Okay. It's amazing. And so when the levels of serotonin are changing in the enteric nervous system and how it's producing it, that thereby is going to change the way that your brain responds and the way that your brain produces its own serotonin. And so the way that the gut is, the the level of health, the what it's comprised of is going to 100% impact your mood. In fact, that's why when people start an SSRI, which is a medication that affects serotonin commonly used in depression. So like Prozac or Lexapro or something. Exactly. And the number one side effect of that category of medication is gastrointestinal distress. And oh. that's because the serotonin reuptake is being impacted not only in the brain, but also in the gut. 
Okay, so not to go totally basic one-on-one, but can you explain what you mean by gut? Because I know that I've got a gut from just certain food choices I've made. I'm trying to get rid of that. I think they call it dad bod. And I'm just like not about that life yet. So I'm trying to get rid of that. But can you explain a little bit what is the gut and why people keep talking about the gut? Yeah. Punch you in the gut. Yeah. The So the gut is the gastrointestinal system. And so that would be involving basically like mouth esophagus down into your stomach your duodenum your large intestine your small intestine so these are basically all organs that are involved in digestion of the food so like basically like if i put stuff in my mouth it goes through my gut exactly before it exits at some before point. it exits right. at some okay point. okay just for the listener you know i'm just like yeah. sometimes we use this word gut and i'm like what are we talking about yeah i, I was just wanted to know yeah so what you're saying essentially is that what we're putting in our body uh-huh. uh is affecting possibly our behavior and mood in addition to how my stomach feels after I ate two hot dogs from the gas station. When you think about it, so you go to the gas station and let's say you have like a super swanky nice new car. Sure. And you have the option to put in diesel or you can put in the three types of octane gas. Sure. And so if you have a car that's supposed to run off of normal gasoline and you put something completely foreign, a.k.a. diesel, in that gas tank... That would be bad. It would be bad. So what you put in your car matters. And if you use the high-performance octane gas, your your car is going to perform better. So it makes sense that what you put in your car is going to in- impact its performance. And it's the same with our bodies. What you put in your mouth, what you put in your gut, what you put in your body is 100% going to impact the way that your body performs. So it seems like when I've got a physical many times when I was younger with the regular medical doctor in my town, they did not ask me about diet at all. All they asked me about was, are you drinking or are you smoking or are you using drugs? They didn't ask me, are you eating four ho-hos before going to lunch <laughs> and then drinking like seven gallons of Kool-Aid? Like no one asked me that. Or did they say, are you are you eating quinoa and kale or broccoli or whatever was the trendy food of the year in the organic food store? Like no one cared. I remember a doctor poking me and saying, you look healthy. Mm-hmm. And I remember having anxiety at the time being like, I know I look healthy. Mm-hmm. Like I'm a pretty healthy person. Like I don't eat like too much stuff from the gas station you know Mm -hmm. but like what (laughs) so like why is this basic thing seem to be overlooked um you know like for instance so like you know what like why is it so difficult for us to understand that if we eat mcdonald's hamburgers and drink shakes all day that our body might start looking like we're eating mcdonald's hamburgers and drinking shakes all day why why is this like escaping us in our culture Well, I mean, if we think of just pure marketing for just a second, you have that happy clown from McDonald's who is like frolicking in the playland with kids. And so a lot of it, I think, is we're just not thinking about the way that we are impacting our health by what we eat. It's more that we have familiarity. It's what we do. It's our culture. It's marketing. And it's fast and delicious. It's Fast and perhaps delicious. That was me avoiding a lawsuit. <laughs> so, so also, it, but I was sort of saying like we might look like the food. Like you are uh-huh. what you eat. You look like the food. I've heard that before. But like uh-huh. you know, I think that was like some sort of eighties jazzercise mantra. So like, uh-huh. what's up with like? You're telling me gut psychology. Mm-hmm. This is what I'm reading. I read this book. It's sixty one pages of eight and a half by eleven. So I don't know how much that would be if it was in like a novel form. And you had like I don't know over 50 scientific sources. I was pretty impressed by that because I was looking at these little footnotes. And I was like, oh, cool. I can see if this is true. Um, so that was cool. But like, like you're not just saying this is going to affect me because I gained all this weight and I'm feeling mm. bad about myself and I'm having low self-esteem. You're saying that somehow what I'm putting in my body is in some scientific strange way affecting the nervous system, which is then going up to my brain because there's nerves. I know this because I'm in psychology. So like your brain is not just in your head, people. Like your brain is all over your body. And we might call our mind, our mind seems to be in our our headspace. But your brain extends all over your body. It's very intelligent. But most of us just associate it with it being in our mind because most of the brain is in the head. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. medicine always right. focus from like the shoulders up. Right. So if you're anxious... It's all about systems. So if you're anxious, you're going to go to a doctor that focuses from the head up. And if you're having stomach upset, you're going to see a gastroenterologist who just looks at that. 
So can I tell, I, I have a story that's coming to mind. Can tell I share that? Tell whatever story you want. So I had actually, there's this, uh, I had a patient come to my office and I'm going to change a little bit of data just to protect their privacy, but we'll say it's like a, a 10 year old boy and he sure. came into my office and he has intense anxiety about his health. And so if you take that child to a standard counselor, the counselor will talk about anxiety and help with skills. And that's really important. Sure. But let's say that there's something else going on that maybe the counselor didn't know about. And so I did a little bit of digging and it turns out that his stomach is often upset. And so then, okay, we could refer to a gastro and do some testing or we could learn a little bit more about what's going on in his diet. And that sounds like it takes a lot of time. Takes time. How long are your visits? The follow up is thirty minutes. Okay, follow up, but you're mm-hmm. the new patient is it? three and a half. Okay, so that hours. makes sense. I was about to say, like, I don't know. I remember going to the doctor and kind of being in and out in like five minutes. Yeah, it was like faster than In and Out Burger. So, like, I'm trying to figure out, like. So you're saying you dug deeper. So what did you yeah, find? Yeah, we dug deeper. And so what I learned is that this little guy gets up in the morning and he chugs two huge glasses of orange juice. And I mean, this guy probably weighs like, I don't know, 60, 70 pounds. He's a little dude. Mm-hmm. And he chugs two huge glasses of orange juice. And then he eats sugary cereal. Oh. And his stomach is upset. And then he gets scared because his stomach is upset and he doesn't understand why. Right. And so then he's going to school and he's feeling a little better. And then he's starving by 1030 because his blood sugar is probably crashing out because he just loaded up on sugar for breakfast. And why else would his stomach be upset with tons of orange juice and cereal? Can you explain that to me? Well, it's incredibly acidic. And so if I chugged that much orange juice on an empty stomach, I would probably feel a little woozy. What is the acid doing in my stomach? Like I've heard of this acidity, alkaline. People try to sell me alkaline water. I'm like, I don't really know what that means. Mm -hmm. But I I like my water from, you know, my Brita filter. (laughs) There's another advertising plug for you, Brita. (laughs) Sour stomach. I mean, our gut is impacted very much by pH. And so pH would be alkaline versus acidic. Oh. So that's why I drink cold brew coffee, because the other one hurts my stomach. Yep. The hot coffee hurts my stomach. Yep. So the cold brew is less acidic. Okay. And so it doesn't hurt your stomach. And just like we get stomach ulcers when our stomach is in a highly acidic state from stress, for example, it can cause that. And so this little dude is putting his tummy in a really acidic state and feeling sick. So, So basically, this is causing a chain reaction of problems. Uh This is causing him to feel sick, then to feel upset. Mm -hmm. Then to feel anxious, then possibly to have behavioral problems at home or maybe even at school. Yep, his sugar's crashing at school. And so, wait a minute. Since I've been a little child, I turn on the television on Saturday morning cartoons and certain (laughs) cereal companies that will remain nameless because I don't want a lawsuit are telling me to dump this something flakes or loops or something or other in my bowl and mm-hmm. it's all like sugary and there's like animals and cartoon things like telling me this is good for you and you're gonna be lucky and all this stuff and then <laughs> and then they tell me oh the best thing to do next is to pull out that big gallon of blank milk now we're not gonna say blank milk because oprah did get sued by the beef producers of america for saying something about not eating enough beef so i'm just gonna say there's some type of animal in our culture that we somehow keep drinking its milk even though we're not babies of that animal and we're drinking it at like (laughs) age 70 so then you pour all that white stuff in Uh, maybe it's white maybe it's different color depends on what kind of cow it comes whoops did i say that i'm bleeping that out i heard nothing um And you pour that on and then you just eat it and then you're good to go. And then you're running in the Olympics and then you're winning everything. And then you're just winning because that's what we do. So like, why is that? That that sounds crazy. Like, what should I be eating for breakfast? Yeah. Like, what what, what about that? Like, why is that messing with his system? Well, and let's talk about, so we could go back to my little guy and talk about just the, the simple science of his blood sugar crashing. But if we go beyond that. What that is going to produce is it's going to produce changes in your gut flora. So whoa, whoa, whoa! Okay, yeah. well, what's gut flora? Yeah, it sounds like coral, like a coral reef, like, well, or like I'm in an yeah. arboretum and there's flora everywhere. It's the arboretum what are you saying of things your growing gut. in my gut. Yes, like you what? have you have multiple pounds of bacteria that live in your gut. Oh my! Okay, I should yes. put a disclaimer before this episode. I have pounds <laughs> of bacteria living in my gut. Yes, and there are good bugs and there are Wait bad bugs, mm-hmm. like Pac Man. Like there's good bugs that are eating the bad bugs or what? I think about the Detroit housing crisis where, you know, nice 
polite people bought houses <laughs> air quote <laughs> they bought- <laughs> have you been to detroit i don't know if there's anybody okay i love detroit sorry don't he hate loves me. detroit so you know they buy these beautiful houses and they mow their lawns and plant flowers and so you have a happy flora of people okay and then we had the crash of the the, the economy in michigan crashed thanks nameless car companies <clears throat> and so then a lot of those people had to leave and they to pursue employment elsewhere and there was a bunch of empty houses em- empty houses and which so were growing what happened to the empty houses well, people were breaking in stealing uh-huh. all the copper selling it to china yep. cooking crack cooking meth yep that's uh, dysbiosis running. what so that's what that's happens a, to our so, gut. I thought that was neighborhood crime. What yep. is this? What is so this? it's neighborhood crime in your gut. And so okay. what you eat will impact the health of your gut. And so you probably, a lot of our listeners have probably heard of probiotics. And so those are good bacteria, just like those nice little neighborhood people mowing their lawns. So those are good bacteria. They take up the quote unquote houses in your gut. Okay. And so when there are lots of good bacteria, you have healthy gut function. And then going back and to the beginning. Flora gut flora going back to the beginning of our interview we were talking about the enteric nervous system and so the happy gut bacteria the happy gut flora will have a more balanced production of neurotransmitters that will then impact your brain in a healthy way versus if you eat a diet that's very acidic or a diet that's high in sugar that's going to change the flora in your gut and so what can happen is for example sugar in the case of that little guy is he may have an overgrowth of a yeast in your gut called candida and candida can it can change the way that we feel the way that our gut feels and so people can have anxiety they can have depression inattention they can have uh, blood sugar spikes and crashes and that can all be as a result of changes in their gut flora and that's just mental emotional so for counselors if your client comes in and your client has any of those symptoms like i said depression anxiety any of that it could be in their gut and then sometimes in addition to that people also have gastrointestinal symptoms but they don't have to so the person may have gas bloating constipation um, it could set the stage for uh, IBS, for example. What's IBS? Irritable bowel syndrome. Oh, I've heard of that. Okay. Yeah, that's just a condition. It's sort of like a. The, there are certain toss out conditions where medicine we don't really know what's causing it and like chronic fatigue fibromyalgia and ibs are examples of that it's just a description it's just a description my bowels are irritated yep exactly and i've had that before yeah i ate a lot of bread and a lot of meatloaf (laughs) one time meatloaf and it was not pretty So, and it probably affected how your gut was feeling. It affected the, the pH of your gut. Your, it was really good, though. Your flora. Until the next day. And then, and then your okay. gut suffered, and it was sort of like the Detroit housing crisis in your gut. And Oh. Yeah. And then you feel fatigued, and you can't focus. And, I did. I just yeah. watched Netflix the whole next day. Yeah. <laughs> so what you're saying to me, which is what I don't want to hear. Nobody wants to hear this. Yes. You're telling me that what I eat is going to affect my gut. Now, are there any good things that I can eat that taste good? Yes. That have things that are going to make my flora grow? Like, I've heard of this kombucha, and I've had it. Uh-huh. It's kind of good. I'm not going to lie. But yeah. they're telling me it's probiotic, so it's, like, super expensive. And I'm like, what the heck? Yeah. So, like, tell me, like, is there is there hope for us people that, like, eating terribly <laughs> things that kill your gut flora and make your gut into some sort of, you know, burned out city? Yeah, burned out city biome. So... Things that are really simple to do is one is um, probiotics. And so you can... Okay, why are they pro? Pro what? What are they pro? What are they doing? What does it mean? Well, they're pro healing. Okay. And so... But like, what are they? These are are bacteria that are good for healing the gut. How do we find that out? There's tons of research in the gut psychology program. You should look at it. Okay, good. I'm just trying to make sure. I'm afraid I've heard of antibiotics and probiotics, and I don't know what Uh they're fighting about. So antibiotics kill the bacteria, the good bugs and the bad bugs. Because if I've got a cold and I go to my doctor and And I say, give me antibiotics. It'll kill all of your good bugs and the bad bugs. And so then then it's it's exactly the housing crisis. So now you have all your houses are empty so wait, in your gut. So how do I get the bugs back? You can take probiotics. So basically I poured bleach on my gut when yes. I took antibiotics to make exactly. sure that I didn't die from some sort of weird bacteria that they think is living in me. <laughs> if you, yeah, if you have a if you have a bacteria. So then I'm on a, I want the pro team. I want the pro bowlers. You want the pro bowlers. And who and are so they? That would Give me be, an example. Well, so you, you just mentioned one. So Oh, kombucha. Kombucha. But like what is in the kombucha? 
probiotics. Those are right. natural but fermented do, bugs. Do you have like a weird name for one of them? Or are they all in like a Latin? Okay, so they, we can look up a list, Wikipedia probiotics, <laughs> and find out what they are. Yeah. So, I mean, you want to look at like bifidobacteria or lactobacillus. That's but, what I was looking for. Oh, generally speaking, when I tell people to buy a probiotic, I say you want to have at least 40 billion and four different bug strains. And so, but you can do it in food. You don't have to go buy a supplement. And so like kimchi and kefir and mm. um sauerkraut i'm are... german so i like sauerkraut yeah so, i eat sauerkraut a lot so it's actually fantastic not lie. fermented foods Ooh, really good fermented foods but you got to watch out that you don't feed the candida so candida that fungus we were talking about right. candida loves sugar fermented foods sugar and carbohydrates Dang and it. so having a good balance is really important to okay. you know there's always there's a possibility of too much of a good thing so this is good. I'm, I'm getting a lot of education here. And um, so essentially, when you're with patients, you're trying to get, you told me, to the root cause. And so sometimes the root cause, from what I'm hearing here, is that the diet and what you're putting in your body can be part of the root cause. Sometimes it's the full root cause or part. sometimes it's just a piece of it. Because if that child is eating trash for years and they have this terrible symptom and and then and then eventually I know from neuroscience that this is now um, developed a pattern in their neurons to possibly continue even if they start eating um, let's say kimchi avocado uh, rice for breakfast with like um, you know beans or some sort of protein in there mm -hmm. and not pop tarts exactly. but they might still be nervous on the way to school because now you've created like when we do something over and over what we're learning is that the you're forming um neuronal connections in the brain this is the newest neuroscience from mm -hmm. interpersonal neuro neurobiology and lots of other neuroscience we're learning mm -hmm. this so so this kid might change his diet now now we don't always know how much how much is that going to affect his anxiety maybe that just makes his stomach feel better or but like right. what if he's still anxious on the way to school what do we do well, I was thinking about food allergies also. And so I had, I want to tell another story. So I had a person come see me and he had been morbidly depressed his entire life. He ate a really clean diet. And, okay. And so he took probiotics and he ate veggies. He ate lean protein. He had, you know, limited his sugar intake, really clean diet. Um, and his vices were he liked his whiskey and he liked his cow's milk. And he also would get like a croissant, you know, with his coffee. Heck yeah, those yeah. are good. Yeah, those are all good things. And so he'd been really depressed his entire life. And there were no gastrointestinal symptoms. The gut seemed healthy by all intents and purposes. But mm -hmm. how do you figure that out? Well, as far as just his clinical experience, like okay, he didn't right. have any, you know, his bowels eliminated properly. Any... No gas, no right. bloating, you nothing did a like big that. Check up. Mm -hmm. And like exactly. blood work? Did you do blood work or something? Or? We do blood work. Okay. Yep. I do head to toe blood work to try to identify the root cause. You can't necessarily look at gut health through blood work, but we could do stool testing or sure. the organic acid test. From right. Or some sort of food allergy test because I, I had to do that a couple years you ago. You just anticipated. It was terrible. Yep. Oh, that's, okay. Sorry. Oh, is you that what are we're talking about? so on that. So okay. exactly. So we did a food allergy test because um, he what was. what is that? How do you. So, okay. So like, is this the one where you go in the doctor's office and they prick your pin like they're torturing you for three hours and figure out if you're allergic to peanuts and you're going to be dying from honeybees <laughs> like is that what we're talking about you're talking about a rast test and so what your immune system does is it produces something called immunoglobulins and immunoglobulins are immune system cells that are created to create Im immunity to certain things so for example if you get a vaccine let's say you get a measles vaccine your sure. body will produce immunoglobulins to protect you from getting measles and so our body sometimes can produce immunoglobulins to things we don't want it to. So you're referring to the RAST test or the skin prick test. Right. That's the kind of allergy test an allergist does. Okay, right. And so that looks at a certain type of an immunoglobulin called an IgE, which is acute anaphylaxis. So that's somebody who eats a peanut. IgE, acute anaphylaxis. Uh -huh. Just for everyone taking notes, remember that. Yes. Okay, so somebody eats a peanut and Their sometimes on the Southwest flights, they won't have any peanuts. Probably because And I'm so depressed. Yeah, probably because they're protecting their survival they of said i couldn't have any yeah they no, only gave me pretzels no peanuts which caused you. me great sadness okay so wait so this is the ig what 
IgE, immunoglobulin. Okay, right. And so that's the, the quick one. So typically people know, oh, I had a walnut, my throat is scratchy. So you're probably having an IgE immune Just response. IgE immune response. Uh-huh. Right. Uh-huh. Okay. And this is why people can be deathly allergic to peanuts. No joke. Yes. I mean, I, I, I'm, with all respect to Southwest, thank you for taking the peanuts off the plane. I don't want someone to die because I had peanuts. Right. Exactly. Right. So it's very severe. And some and people so, have a honeybee allergy and they just have to stick themselves with a, what's that called? A needle? An of, EpiPen. EpiPen. Uh-huh. Right. Epinephrine. Yep. And so that will help counteract it. So the other main type of immunoglobulin is IgG, which is delayed hypersensitivity. And that's what we look at when we do food allergy Time testing. Del- okay. IgG, uh-huh. delayed hypersensitivity. So that means what does that you, even can, mean? you can eat that croissant on Monday sure. and your body will slowly build up an immune response to that. And you may get congested and coffee and so what on Friday. So like... What did my body not like about the croissant? So this goes back to one of the theories is it talks about leaky gut. Sure. And so I like to use the analogy with my patients is your gut, it should be like a garden hose. And so you plug it into the water spigot and water comes through it and it shouldn't be leaking out the garden hose. Right. So a healthy colon is the same. And so when your body wants to send information out of the colon into the bloodstream, it can do that through receptors. But... If you imagine leaving a garden hose in the desert out in the sunshine, it's going to get cracks. And then when you turn the water on, it's going to all come out of the hose. I've actually had that experience, but keep going. (laughs) Yes. And so the same kind of metaphorically, something similar can happen in the gut. And we call that leaky gut. And so then proteins in your gut escape when they're not supposed to out of the gut. And then your immune system identifies that as an intruder. Through receptors? It will see the protein, and so your immune system cells will see that and flag it, and so then your body will create antibodies against that, and so you have immunoglobulins, which is the memory, and so So. then let's say you ate milk for you know 40 years of your life right. and those proteins are constantly getting out where they're not supposed to so now you have all sorts of immunoglobulins right that are waiting for that to try to protect you they try to kill it by mounting so immune response basically i'm minding my own business i'm eating a croissant uh-huh. and i did find out from my doctor recently who's not you disclaimer she's not my doctor <laughs> Uh, that I was had a, a food sensitivity to wheat, which sa- sh- they said I was not full blown allergic to wheat. I guess they said it was IgG response, um, mm-hmm. which I forgot what they even said until you just talked about it now. But anyway, that's why I got some sort of stuffy nose and some other weird symptoms that I'd rather not talk about on the show <laughs> due to eating the wheat, which is in things that I like called bread, which is the best thing in the world and universe, and everyone mm-hmm. should have some. So now my body, I'm minding my own business, eating my bread, and then my body's like, wait, like, we're attacking you now to save you from bread. Like, why? Why is it doing that? Why did I, like, all of a sudden my body just, like, hate me? Why is my body turning against me? <laughs> it's probably been doing that slowly over time, but the... the because because the- Why? As your disease progresses or as the inflammation progresses. Because it's like sick of bread? Like, or just because it just randomly happens. It doesn't necessarily randomly happen. It could be because you're... Your gut was inflamed due to lots of other reasons. So maybe oh. you were eating sugars, oh. refined carbs, like who knows? So, so basically, what, this is the health of my entire gut, and then something sets it off. Which could be wheat, or, or wheat multiple could things. be an innocent bystander that now your immune system is targeting. So, like Red Bull and Skittles, and then like for years, all of a sudden, now my flora is depressed, things are not good, and then all of a sudden, this just doesn't like this one food, or two, or three, or more foods. And leaky gut is defined as more than 12 foods. And so if we go back to my patient, we, so she, he had been depressed for his entire life basically. And he felt like there was this dark cloud over him constantly. And he wanted every day to die. And he'd been in counseling for decades. And the only thing keeping him alive was that he loved his family. Oh my gosh. And um, so like I said, this is an example of where counseling is really powerful. It's probably part of what kept him alive, but it wasn't moving him forward because there's an obstacle to cure. So we did the food allergy test and his immunoglobulins, his IgGs to milk were through the roof. Oh. So Which, he faithfully took out right. all cow's milk. Right. And within three weeks, his depression was 100% gone. And he felt like, like he 
like came into my office like laughing and then crying for joy because he was so much better and it was something very simple as far as just looking at his gut looking at his food allergies he did the gut psychology program healed his gut Mm -hmm. and he's totally better so this is just wild to me because like i think that in the current medical model that i was even taught in grad school that you know your mind is just a separate thing that we're treating and it's separate than the body and now what i'm hearing through talking to you and having talked to you other times off this podcast is that essentially you know all different so many different factors could be influencing our mood mental health behavior that are not even due to our thinking Mm -hmm. so it's like this guy is hanging on thanks to psychology, you know, counseling and his family. And then he just is actually his depression is due to some sort of physiological response to something that he was supposed to le- like supposedly good for him, mm-hmm. um, according to marketing. And then he just changes something and it gets out of his system and he starts feeling better. And he's like, oh, my gosh, probably also. I mean, I was thinking about this like. He was depressed because of this diet and this, you know, inflammation or allergy or whatever you want to call it. And then he had been doing all these coping skills for years. So when he finally got this thing, obstacle to cure, I -hmm. suppose you call it, Mm -hmm. removed and his gut started getting better, then all of a sudden he already had his coping skills. He had already done all Mm -hmm. this existential work. And so then he's like, I'm great. I feel wonderful. I'm better. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like that's that's kind of what I'm hearing. It's like kind of a there's a couple of different factors going on. And it's very it's that's why you have to find a really good naturopathic physician that you trust is because, you know, sometimes it's as simple as that guy where he took out the dairy and he was golden. But, sure. you know, like with that case of the little girl or the uh, or the little boy, like whomever it is. It may be more like, okay, I'm blood sugar crashing because I'm eating toaster strudels for breakfast. And so we have that. But plus, maybe there's a food dye issue. And we talk about in the gut psychology program that there's a lot of relationships between food dyes and behavioral issues in children. And so there's oh, a lot more yes. complexity to it. And so to to empower your patients is to just to do some investigation of you as an individual because your gut, your body may have different needs than somebody else. And so maybe one person does great off of dairy, but maybe another person, they feel much, much worse off of it. And so that's the tricky thing with diets is, you know, there's the Atkins diet, there's the paleo diet, there's the keto diet, and there's all these different diets, but they all exist with the presupposition of a certain issue. Okay, you're sick because you can't have carbs. You're sick because your blood type says that Mm. you should only Mm -hmm. eat meat and the thing with a gut psychology diet is i created that in what i'm accomplishing is to teach you how to eat in a way that is healthy for your body and so i talk about removing the obstacles to cure so we talk about things that are unhealthy for your diet like artificial sugars and dyes and so i wanted to comment on that because i made some notes oh and uh, now we have notes. <laughs> and I like that you divided it up into four modules. So uh-huh. actually, it was simple because you're right. When I was reading this, I didn't see like a one size fits all model for mm-hmm. people being like, you need to just eat this and eat this and don't eat that and da 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 da. And nobody likes that. There's so many diet fads and everybody around January 1st when they wake up hungover. They're like, oh my gosh, my life is a mess. I need to, you know, get in shape. Spring's coming, swimsuit season, blah, blah, blah. And then they like subscribe to some diet. Um, You know, it used to be on television. You'd call 1-800, blah, blah, blah. And now you just go and click on your Facebook or your Instagram. And all of a sudden it's like, hey, we're sending you meals in the mail and, you know, all this stuff. And so like, they're like, this is what you need to do. Just eat chicken. Like, that's what you need to do. Just eat chicken and rice. That's what you got to do. It's just perfect for everybody. And it's like, what you're saying to me is like, uh, no, we need to like, first of all, give you some education, give uh-huh. you some information. And then also there is no one size fits all. We're trying to learn your body. I guess that yes. sounds almost like your medical practice where you spend so much time with people. So I want to talk about this. You divide it up into four sections. So module one is what you call decoding labels and cutting out the garbage. Yes. And so essentially, I like that chapter a lot because I didn't even actually know a lot of this stuff. I should probably pay attention to what you tell me when we're off 
uh, the year, but <laughs> you, you were talking about, you know, just all these different yeah. things that I uh-huh. hadn't thought about. Like, um, you went through just sort of educating people about what did labels mean and like what does this particular label in America, the Nutrition Facts label, mean mm-hmm. and what are all these indicators? Mm-hmm. And then like how do you read this and like how do you know what's a good source of certain things or what's a bad source of certain things? And there's like 12, 12 ingredients to look out for you talk about. Um, I really like that because it's talking about the different sugars, MSG, nitrates, just simple things. So it's like, you know, I didn't see like – don't eat this and don't eat that. Like mm-hmm. it didn't have any of that. You just said like, if you're going to buy this, just make sure it doesn't have this in it. Because I know, for instance, you know, it's baseball season starting up here and everybody likes a good hot dog. But what I found out is that a lot of <laughs> hot dogs add nitrates to them, which can be bad. I don't know why, but why Why are nitrates bad? <laughs> well, they're chemically derived. And so it can, they're, you know, you think oh, about okay. like, do Scientists you want Scientists created sodium nitrate. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, do you want to eat foods that you know a farmer pulled out of the earth or something that a man in a hazmat suit made in a lab? I probably want to eat something pulled out of the earth. I see. I was just looking at that. It said uh, uh, sodium nitrate and and nitrate uh, are natu- uh, are naturally occurring. Well, oh, I see. Well, scientists in the laboratory created sodium nitrate. Both substances are used utilized to preserve meat in the place of salt, and both are considered nitrosamines, which have been linked to DNA damage, and then you yeah. cite something. So interestingly enough, I found out they have hot dogs at Trader Joe's, another plug, Trader Joe's, if you're out there, that don't have nitrates. They just have salt. Imagine that. Yes. Just salt, and they taste delicious. Just in time for baseball season. I'm a <laughs> Chicago person, so mustard, no ketchup. <laughs> yes, exactly. And that's what I'm aiming to do is just educate you and empower you and not take things away, but rather help you make healthier choices about what you're eating. And so that's the whole module one is is how to understand labels, what things uh, maybe to do alternatives, things to avoid. Right, but it wasn't making me avoid foods, which I liked. Yeah. I mean, you were just sort of like, look out for this when you read labels. And I kind of felt really, I was really interested. Um, but I did not even know about potassium bromate. I mean, look, this is crazy. I mean, this has been linked to c- cancer in some studies and toxic to the kidneys. And yep. they're just like putting it in bread. And all of this is referenced. Uh, I see that. Yeah. Yep. This so, is- and I, I worked really hard to make sure of the highest integrity in the references. And so PubMed studies, um, a lot of double blind studies. And so, and that's another thing is when, when people are looking at, you know, Mercola or Livestrong or other sources to understand what they're doing with their diet and their food is look at their references and make sure like okay who's funding that study so you're talking about like popular like uh-huh. we're alternative blogs for alternative exactly. things like you're talking about like that trend of kind of like yep. blogging like did you know that if you eat soy you're gonna grow breasts or something like that oh and i could i could talk a lot about soy but that Wait, could be for another podcast could be another podcast but, but like yes. all, you mean these sensationalized and, news stories yes integrity in research integrity in science is really important in um in my practice and naturopathic medicine is a lot of focus in using rigorous science and so you know the gut psychology program is like you said there's over 50 references and they're they're going back to the american journal of psychiatry gastroenterology a lot of different studies right and i like that you did the research because i don't like doing research so what another feature about the book I liked was that at the end of each module, you had like a little quiz with an answer key. And that was kind of fun. Yeah, maybe we can quiz you. Uh, I'm going to fail. So <laughs> let's just not do that. Maybe later. Um, I also <laughs> like that there was a homework section and sort of an application section of each module or chapter. Mm-hmm. And I like that you track um, if they do, if they take the challenge, you have them track energy, appetite, focus, anxiety, depression, and other sort of things to see if they notice any difference within a week or two of, of doing this, which yes. I, I liked, um, you know, and so that was, that was pretty cool to me. And then I liked, um, I just want to go over a little bit more of this cause I liked this part that the way you framed it. And I was like, Ooh, cool. I've conquered chapter one or module one. Now proteins. This was a fun chapter. I, uh, proteins expanding your palate from chicken and cheese. Now everyone likes chicken quesadillas. So are you trying to tell <laughs> us that we can't have chicken quesadillas? I am not telling you, you can't have chicken quesadillas. However, there are lots of other delicious proteins you can add 
in order to expand it. And, you know, we find that, so if we go back to the garden hose analogy and talk about leaky gut, is if you're continually eating something and you have leaky gut, you have those holes in your garden hose, right. that maybe you weren't allergic to cheese to begin with and something else happened. Maybe you took a ciprofloxacin antibiotic and it caused a lot of inflammation in the gut. Um, and, and so maybe you had a leaky gut and then you just eat chicken and cheese constantly by having the same proteins constantly being introduced to your system, you can actually right. develop a sensitivity to that because, like we said, the body's going to produce immunoglobulins oh. to things it sees all the time. And so you may be allergic to it by proxy as opposed mm-hmm. to it being the causal factor. I like that you said develop a sensitivity because that reminds me a lot of counseling. It's sort of like a trigger. If like something bad happens, then you might be triggered by things that remind you of that. Like de- mm-hmm. that could be another way of just saying, I mean, it's not really developing a sensitivity. It's obviously a symptom and there's, you know, science to back that. But in terms of like, okay, I'm just like rubbing the same food on my body all the time. Like it's going <laughs> to probably not like it. Yep. Um, now you made a big deal about proteins. I mean, you literally have an entire module on proteins. So I read in here, it said proteins are linked to neurotransmitters. You discuss amino acid precursors, neurotransmitters, what deficient amounts of each neurotransmitter can cause. And then I love I love this part about like there's this whole guide of all these amino acid pathways, the neurotransmitters they correspond to, what what the deficiencies can cause. And then here's some foods, both with meat options and non-meat options mm-hmm. that could help you gain these amino acids, which could then apparently help you with your um, neurotransmitters. So can you tell me why proteins are a big deal? Well, protein is important. It contains the building blocks for amino acids. Okay. And amino acids are the building blocks for the energy that your cells use. And so if you don't have enough protein, your cells aren't going to have energy. And so there's something called a mitochondria. I like to compare that to the battery in a car. Okay. And so the mitochondria, they use the amino acids and the different cofactors that you're consuming, all those ingredients. And then they produce ATP, which is like the electricity that comes out of the battery of your car. And so if you're not eating food that has the energy to help your mitochondria make energy... Right? So if your mitochondria is not getting the ingredients from the protein, you're not going to get energy. And so that's going to affect the way your body feels and it's going to mm. affect the way that you feel emotionally and mentally. And so people who have brain fog, poor concentration, depression, and muscle weakness, fatigue, right. chronic fatigue syndrome, we see this a lot. Right. So getting good protein in is so important. Yeah. And you know, it's funny about protein, like in, we were talking about breakfast, but mm-hmm. like if I go to like, and I, Hey, I love Grand Rapids restaurants. I love all of you. You're all my, you're all my Christmas list. But like, if I go to my favorite <laughs> coffee shops, they aren't like offering me much protein. They're like, mm-hmm. here's this really sweet donut. And I'm like, yep. yes, thank you, God. And then they're like, they're like, here's this really good croissant with your coffee. Yep. And they're like, here's this really like, I don't know, something like a biscotti or something and like there's no protein there i mean the best i've seen is like starbucks which i no offense to starbucks but i only go to you in the airport when i'm desperate but they have little you know you can buy eggs which Mm -hmm. are are hard-boiled eggs which have protein but like you know and and if you're at home you can cook eggs but it makes the whole house smell and quite frankly i ain't got time for that so like i mean (laughs) essentially you know there's so many temptations out there to not eat protein for breakfast so like what if i don't eat protein for breakfast what i'm just like eh, save that for later Mm -hmm. what happens to me and that's that story of our little person and he crashed out crash yeah so So protein gives you yourself so people crave carbs and sugar yes and those increase dopamine your your feel-good neurotransmitter so like the same thing that most drugs attach to yeah Exactly. Like, so I mean, you illegal feel, drugs like heroin goes so to it's dopamine. Quick energy. Right. And so you feel quick. really good. You have mm-hmm. quick energy. Right. But it doesn't sustain you like fats and proteins. So, and so then you crash. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That makes more sense. So I should be eating more protein and not just downing a bowl of cinnamon toast crunch and trying to run two miles. Exactly. Okay. So that does remind me of an office episode where Michael ate Alfredo to make sure that he could run in that <laughs> He was carb loading for was a carb marathon. Loading. So, what, so he was carb loading, but like apparently he probably should have had protein loading. Is that what you're kind of saying here? <laughs> protein would have been a lot more. But not while he's running. In not the while he's weather. running. But I mean, carb loading does give you quick energy at your disposal. And then if you're running a short race, that's a good idea or 
something like that. Okay, got it. <laughs> and he should have done it the night before, the not night the before, morning of. Not the morning of eating Alfredo <laughs> before a race. Can't endorse that. Okay. So um, I like that. So there's a lot of, in- so much information. We don't have time to cover it all, but I just want to, I'm just trying to hit some highlights here because it was just really interesting to me. I like this part. You said diversify your diet, rotating the foods you eat. It in- reduces the likelihood of food sensitivity development. You can get a variety of sources of protein that your body can use differently, and you can have the opportunity to explore different types of delicious and tasty foods. I like that part because I like going to different restaurants. Mm-hmm. I get really bored with going to the same restaurant. Mm-hmm. Maybe because I grew up near a mall that had <laughs> Olive Garden, Chili's, and some sort of place that served bourbon chicken, whatever the hell that is. So um, I got really sick of that, and I've been like seeking out different restaurants. You know, there's a, there's a Spanish restaurant, a couple Spanish restaurants now in Grand Rapids. You got the American New, American Old, American Cheap Bar Food. You got, you know, um, Thai food, Chinese food, German food. Oh, they got a new Nordic restaurant. Um, yeah, so all these different food, foods. So you're saying that's a good thing. <laughs> Diversity is good, yes. Okay, and then you did talk in here about different ways to cook food and what to eat. And you get, you are uh, both um, talking about non-meat and meat options. And you, you quote Shakespeare here. You say, our bodies are gardens, our wills are the gardeners. Shakespeare said that. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. And again, you give us a lot of quizzes and little things to do and little homework. So... Um, Number three, the truth about fats, oils, and carbohydrates. So that was really interesting to me because I didn't know this truth about oils, fats, and carbohydrates. So can you tell us a little bit about about that? Yeah. There was a fad a while ago talking about how fats were terrible, and if you eat fat, you're going to get heart disease. I remember that fad. Yeah. You remember that fad about fat? Yeah. And um, in, thankfully, that's since been redacted. Oh, and really? it turned it, really what it is is it's more about inflammation and so oh. heart disease is in response to inflammation in the body and so if you have inflammation it's kind of like if you think of a, like a scrape on your knee you fell on a rock and scraped your knee that's that's inflammation inflammation is your immune system cells are going there and it's red and it's swollen so we can get inflammation in our entire bodies by eating things like chicken and cheese all the time or carbohydrates and toaster strudels or whatever, french fries, some inflammatory foods. Mm -hmm. And so inflammation creates a hospitable ground for for cholesterol to attach. And so they were saying, oh, we see cholesterol Uh, here, fat and cholesterol are the problems. But it's not. So you always got to go deeper. And so it's the inflammation. And so we we actually see that really healthy fats. So if we look like the ketogenic diet, we see right. really healthy fats, oils. Not only are they good for feeding your body and feeding your cells, but they're in fact, they'll reduce the likelihood so of a heart attack. So fat isn't bad. It's the type of fat. And it's the imbalance of fats. The balance so of fats. So there's different types. I won't get into this today because that could be a whole that podcast. That could be a whole podcast. But we there's don't have time for that. different types yeah. of saturated fats. And so... Co- coconut oil is a type of saturated fat, but it's a different type that's actually really good for your body. Right. And then we have omega fatty acids, like omega-3, right. omega-6, omega-9, right. and it's all about a good balance. And so, you know, you don't want to drink 26 gallons of water, but you don't want to drink zero gallons of water. It's about finding that nice, happy medium for what your body needs. Okay. Yeah. And I like that. And I'll move on from this chapter in a moment, but I like that you, since I'm in psychology, I love that you said there was, you mentioned some study that the human brain is approximately 60% fat. Yeah. Yeah. So if I'm just eating KFC, oh gosh, I shouldn't have called that out. If I'm going to my local blank blank store and getting this certain bird that's deep fried in some sort of oil Mm. and it tastes delicious. (laughs) um, And if I'm eating that like every day, all day, what kind of fat is going in my brain? Yeah. So if you think about your brain being mostly fat, so you have every every single cell in your body has something called a phospholipid bilayer. And so right. if you imagine that you have this nucleus, this piece in the middle, and then surrounding it, you have uh, you have the head and the tail of this fat molecule. So it's um, and that surrounds it. And they kind of really, truly, they look like little sperm with two legs. Oh, <laughs> There's hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Okay. So the hydrophobic is the head and it goes away from the water and then the hydrophilic is towards the water. And so it creates this like little protective fatty layer around every single cell and then that will 
impact the way the cell survives, gets nutrients, delivers information. And so if oh. you are eating food that contributes to that phospholipid bilayer, then right. you're obviously going to have healthier function of your cells. And if you're eating foods that take away from that, then your cells are going to struggle. And so in this chapter, I talk about how to eat healthy fats, types of fats and foods, balancing that. Right. And how to, to optimize that for your body. Yeah, and I like that you didn't tell me not to eat stuff. You were talking more about balancing. It sounded very mindful, I would say. Actually, you don't even, I don't think you use that word in this book, but it, it sort of makes me think of mindful mm. mindfulness, which is trying to just sort of find that balance between um, between states. Of I being, love that. Yeah. Because even the way that you perceive your food, eat your food, harvest your food, prepare it, is going to impact the way that your biology and your physiology receives and processes and integrates the food. Yes, and being this as a psychology and counseling podcast, and of course philosophy too, we really want our brains to be functioning on all cylinders. eight cylinders. How about eight cylinder brain? I like that. Um, <laughs> so the last part I wanted to kind of comment on, there's two last little parts, is this module four, which I think is going to scare some people away, to be quite honest with you, <laughs> because it's called Give Me Some Fruits and Veggies. <laughs> and I live in this country called the United States. And here, you know what? If if it's in if there's fruits and veggies in my in my ice cream, I'm cool with that. Like throw it in a smoothie that's like Hide tastes it. like chocolate. I want you know <laughs> like I had a smoothie the other day and it had like chocolate in it, like a lot of chocolate. And she said there was kale and spinach. I couldn't even taste it. It was amazing. Yeah. But then I felt like oh, I give myself a gold star for eating some kale and spinach. I ate some kale and spinach, but I ate like you know like a pound of chocolate probably. But it was really good. And, you know, like, and when I went to the state fair with my friend, Michael, uh, shout out, Michael, he ate a fried Twinkie and he had like so much fun and I wanted to eat fried Twinkies, but like I was already <laughs> feeling ill from like that huge lemonade thing I drank and this giant ass turkey leg that was like just so big and it, it was like bigger than my stomach. And like, you know, we kind of went wild, but like when I was at the state fair, there were no fruits and veggies. It was like fried. Oh, wait, there was fried pickles. I, fried I, pickles. I'll take that back. Yep. So like, you know, we live in a country, you know, we're, I'm, we're, you know, it's like when you go going crazy, you, you got to have cotton candy and turkey legs and lemonade and, you know, fried Oreos and fried this and fried that. And like, hey, you know what? Module four. Do we really need module four? Give me some fruits and veggies. Can you explain why? <laughs> Well, of course, they're an important part of getting nutrients. And so your oh. veggies have fiber. Okay. And so we talked about stabilizing your blood sugar so you're not crashing out. Fiber does that. It does? Fiber actually, more fiber, less risk of colorectal cancer. So I can't just get fruit smoothies with chocolate. I should actually eat the fruit is what you're saying? Well, I mean, I guess you if however I can get it in you. Okay. I'm happy. You <laughs> That's can true. Blend it I up. I or... fiber help. No wonder I'm having problems. Okay. <laughs> That'll be off the podcast. Keep going. Edit. So, and veggies are rich in something marvelous. I, I'll point this out because I could talk for days on fiber and veggies and fruits. But one cool thing that our, your listeners might not be familiar with are the wonders of anthocyanidins and polyphenols. I have no idea what you just said. We'll just... Is that Latin? You just smile and nod, say, okay. oh, yes. Yes, and the polyphenols and the something or other. So if you want to prevent Alzheimer's, you want to prevent cognitive decline, if you want to prevent cancer, if you want to prevent inflammation, if you want to heal your body, those are the tickets. Um, there are people are out there that are really into NRF2s, and they take Protandum, and they're into all these different kinds of supplements because the name of the game is antioxidants, antioxidants, antioxidants. Oh, I've heard of those. Yes. So oxidative damage. If you see a, a piece of iron that's sticking out of the ground and it's rusted, mm -hmm. that's oxidative damage. And so we can have oxidative damage in our brain. Oxygen causes oxidative damage. So we need oxygen, right. but we also need ways in our body to counteract damage caused by hyperoxygenation. And so veggies and fruits are our number one source of antioxidants. So they have thousands of nutrients, you know, vitamin Bs and all sorts of things that they're comprised of, but the antioxidant benefits far outweigh anything else that you can consume. And so the tip that I want to share today is the darker and the richer the color, the more you're going to have of the anthocyanidins and the polyphenols, and therefore more antioxidant and nutritional benefits. So for example, collard greens are much more nutritious than iceberg lettuce. 
And raspberries oh. are going to be much more nutritious than um, like a purple or like actually a green grape. Oh, okay. So the richer the color, the more polyphenols or anthocyanidins are in there. I do love raspberries and blueberries. They're among my favorite fruits. Especially when you can pick them out of the, the earth and you can just eat Ooh. them fresh, now organic. You're, now we're talking about summer in Michigan. Yep. Picking blueberries. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now I saw this in here. It said polyphenols boost your mood. I just found this, by the way. Uh-huh. I, this was not a preloaded answer. In a randomized <laughs> double-blind study published by the Journal of Psychopharmacology, and then you cite the source in the year down below, which I'm not going to read because that's boring for me right now. Researchers discovered that persons given high doses of polyphenols reported significantly increased self-rated scores of calmness and contentedness contentedness compared to the placebo, which I believe is like a uh, piece of sugar or something. Placebo is the power of the brain in helping itself feel better. Oh, sure, sure. In that, in that, well, in that in that instance they Uh were given polyphenols and then something had no polyphenols exactly and then the polyphenol people had significantly increased self-rated scores of calmness and contentedness which is interesting and that's in the journal of psychopharmacology which is weird exactly they're studying that but know your references yeah so um yeah um just want to say a few more things um and you have a bunch of references on this and you talk about you know you're you're very diverse in your fruits and veggies so you're just trying to encourage people to put something in their diet yes okay and you're not saying take away something you're just saying adding something which i like this because i do think it appealed to everybody but i do think this is going to be the hardest sell module four because in america <laughs> you know i don't know it's just not like it's not that popular to eat these fruits and veggies but um anyway in recent years and then you cite a study It has come to light that depression is an inflammatory disorder, though there is still controversy as to how this inflammation causes depression. It is known that part of the effectiveness of SSRIs in treating depression is their anti-inflammatory qualities. So that was interesting to me that part of possibly why Lexapro works is it's partly anti-inflammatory. Can you explain about that? It's like a drop of water in an ocean. And Mm -hmm. so the, the doctors were observing that they would give somebody an SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor like Prozac, and it takes, you know, prob- a minimum of 14 days for sure. the serotonin reuptake to change enough to be appreciably beneficial for a person if it will be beneficial, although it took Prozac over 20 studies to show that it was better than placebo. Actually, but- 28 studies before the F- before they found two studies. The FDA requires two studies beat placebo. It took Prozac, 20, I believe, 27 or 28. That's, yeah, that's in amazing. the Great Psychotherapy Debate by Bruce Wampold. So anyway. I love that. Thank you for that. That's brilliant. And, and so they were they were noticing that people were showing some improvements. And so they're like, okay, is this placebo? People just feel better taking a medication, right? Or is there something we're not we're not seeing that that could be helpful than the medication? And so they conducted a study, and it turns out that there's a teeny tiny anti-inflammatory benefit to these medications, and that's what was helping. And so in patients who have depression due to inflammation. Mm-hmm anti-inflammatories can mitigate that or make it better and so we have naturally our planet is filled with so many natural anti-inflammatories that are so powerful for example dark leafy greens fish oil really brightly colored berries and things like that yeah you know actually it was interesting uh I'm, we're here in Arizona, and Dr. Andrew Weil of University of Arizona, who's a famous, I believe, doctor, uh, Dr. Weil, okay, whatever, he's written books that are in Walgreens and CVS and all that. He has a restaurant here that he started with this guy named Sam Fox called True Food Restaurant, and one of their big appeals or advertising is that we're we're serving an anti-inflammatory diet. So you're telling me, so if these people's depression was due to inflammation and they're taking the SSRI and there's a little bit of a, a benefit, could they just go to True Foods and eat anti-inflammatory for like three meals? a day kind of like an anti supersize me type thing where instead of eating mcdonald's three meals a day like eat anti-inflammatory foods and that could possibly have an effect if that's why their depression was caused yeah well i don't want to say they should go to true food all the time (laughs) i do like their food their food is pretty good but i i really like to encourage my patients to prepare their own meals and know where your food came from and um, you know, pay attention to whether or not the food has been sprayed with pesticides because you can't wash that off in a lot of cases and you know to really be a part of the intention the mindfulness of preparing your food and when you eat the food mindfully tell yourself this is good for my mind this is good for my body and that will be so much more powerful than if you're just like okay i'm gonna chow this down while i'm driving to my next gig and it's anti-inflammatory because the the, 
the act of eating can be pro-inflammatory. So that's interesting. Um, in our culture here, we like to eat a lot of things really quickly. Yes. We like to we like to chow down, as we call it, and we like to go through the drive through, mm-hmm. and we're like eating a burrito, and we got a soda in the other hand, and we're driving down the 101 here at like 75 miles an hour, stuffing this <laughs> amazing carne asada burrito in our mouth, following it with some Dr. Pepper. Uh-huh. So I know that, okay, carne asada, it's spicy, it might be a little inflammatory in the soda, blah, 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 but what, so are you saying also the way that I'm jamming this burrito down my gaping maw <laughs> that fast while driving 70 miles an hour could be an inflammatory act? Yes, exactly. Because it's why is that like the burrito gets in there really quickly and it mixes with the soda? Like what's happening? Well, and if you think about the the state of your nervous system, and so we oh. have two primary states. We right. have the sympathetic, you know, the sympathetic state, fight or flight, right. riding around like a driving really fast, yeah. going places. Listening to like awesome rock music. Yeah, you're you're rocking out to rock or whatever you listen or to that or hip, exactly. Sure. Yeah, you're dub stepping with your burrito. Right. Pedal to the metal, Mm -hmm. going on the 101, getting to your gig. Uh, And so that's that's a fight or flight response. Your body is producing cortisol. Cortisol can be pro-inflammatory. And then there's rest and digest. Parasympathetic. Which is parasympathetic, exactly. And so... It, you're gonna so they call it rest and digest because in that state your body is sending all of the digestive juices the blood the effort to your tummy oh. and so that's why when people are eating sometimes their tummies get nice and warm yeah. and they feel more sleepy and it's because your body is focusing its energy on being in the moment and digesting optimally and you're going to pull out more of the nutrient benefit from your food if you're in that state versus if you're shoving oh. carne asada down your gaping maw going 75 miles an hour at dubstep speed. That's true. So, okay. So, yeah, I did I did spend some time <laughs> in Europe, actually, and study abroad. And I remember being in Europe and wondering what in the world was wrong with the waiters. I'm like, hey, where are you guys? Like, come back to the table. Pick up the pace. Like, what's happening? I ordered this menu of the day, which is American. It's got an appetizer. It's got an entree. It's got a little sorbet or, like, a little coffee or something afterwards. Because us Americans, like, I was like, I ordered something, and it was, like, so small. And I was like, what are they doing? They're jipping me. This is, like, a ripoff. I can't believe they're serving me this little food, and they think that's the thing. So I got menu del dia or menu of the day, which had three things. So I could, like, survive and not die in (laughs) Europe. And, like... They would like wait. It was like forever. It's like the entree comes out, and we're like, "Oh, thank you." And they're like, "We're eating." And they're and then I was with the, uh, I one time we ate with some some people that were from that country, and they ate very slowly, and I was very confused. And then the waiter's gone for like an hour. I'm like, did they forget our order? I'm like, no, no, no. This is just this is just what we do. This is our pace of life here. We spend two to three hours at dinner. I'm like, I didn't budget this in. I got to get to the dance hall. Like you know, like <laughs> I'm getting bored. I need to go surfing. Like what's going on? I need to. You know, check my email at the internet cafe. This is before cell phones were like big. But like, (laughs) I remember that. And I remember thinking like, that's really weird. And I don't remember having that experience in the US except maybe on Thanksgiving when we try to eat an entire turkey and like 17, you know, 17 sides (laughs) and then like be like, oh yeah, I want five pieces of pie, all different. Um, So like, I did think of that. Um, you know, that rest and digest thing, you can see that, that uh, your body might be in taking the food a little slower. That might be better for you. So that's interesting how our culture isn't really into that. Slow and it food gives your thing. body time to make acid. So the whole process of eating is really intelligent. Wait, so I want acid now? Yeah. So okay, you, tell me about that. So when, when we think about food, we're like Pavlo, Pavlov's dogs, and we think about food and we start salivating. And so our body produces amylase, which mm-hmm. is an enzyme. In the mouth, and enzymes, the salivary and amylase in particular, will break down the food while you're chewing it. Wait a minute. So my food starts breaking down when I put it in my mouth? Yes. Well, ideally. So swallowing the burrito whole like an egg roll is not a good plan (laughs) for using amylase. Yeah, it's it's by you're bypassing you're <laughs> you're amylaseless, and then it goes down into your stomach, and so like if you chew slowly, in the meantime your stomach is producing hydrochloric acid, and your body's making more enzymes, and then it goes down into your stomach, and then you have this sphincter which closes at the base of your esophagus, at the top of your stomach, sure, your cardiac sphincter, so that closes, and then it basically makes your stomach into this like sack that's like squishing and breaking down and macerating all. All of this food and mixing it up with all these enzymes and acid and so if you're doing if you're like oh i gotta eat and you shove it down your face yeah yeah come it, in a hurry so that's so the the case i talked about right. at the beginning of that little person who was 
eat, who's having anxiety about just anxiety about right. their health. The OJ one. The OJ. So that person, when he would eat lunch, he would eat that way because he would be starving because he was crashing from his oh. his carbohydrate breakfast. So he would eat really fast, and he felt like he had a stone in his stomach, and that's because he wasn't taking the time to allow his body to make the yummy acids and enzymes to break it down. So. Getting into that rest and digest state, not only is it just putting you more in a parasympathetic state where you can digest, but it gives your body the time to do what it's supposed to do. And so then people who don't do that and they eat too fast, they don't have enough stomach acid. The acid doesn't stimulate that sphincter to close. So instead it goes up your esophagus. <gasps> people get and reflux. And you burp and you taste nasty stuff. <laughs> and then your and then doctor you take all these tums. Your doctor puts you on a proton pump inhibitor, which then prevents your Dear stomach God. from making acid, okay. and then that changes the pH of your gut, and you get dysbiosis, and then it spirals. And you everything get to get that out. other medication that the country star. Okay, so anyway, so I, what I'm hearing here is now for <laughs> all psychology clinicians out there, we're always advocating that we, you know, people do 20 minutes of mindfulness or whatever to mm -hmm. kind of like calm yourself or do some sort of walking activity to calm the mind and sort of slow the mind down so that the the mind can remember um, certain things and so that the mind can you know start building a stress response and be able to kind of uh, emotionally regulate and so essentially what you're saying is we should also have people eating slower yep Boy. eat more slowly take okay. your time be more european okay interesting and so i last thing about this is that you had um stuff for picky eaters on how to eat vegetables which i thought was fun but i'm gonna leave for people to read that if they want yes because the if you don't love veggies and things right. like that i have strategies to get it in right so that's pretty cool because you know i love some veggies but some i just no not a fan so i also like that you had this four tips for success which i'm not going to go totally into but it was called the buddy system mm -hmm. healing the gut make it a habit and spice it up mm -hmm. seriously sounds like a movie i like it it was cool <laughs> so there's strategies in here um there's quizzes homework recipes even a few recipes at the end i think that was more for the people that you knew that weren't going to like fruits and veggies like i predicted um and then so and then the science here the references so Thanks so much, um, Dr. King, for coming on the show. Can you tell us a little bit about how people can get this book? Yes. Uh, we have a webpage. It's Gut Psychology. And so you can go to www.gutpsychology.com, which is G-U-T-P-S-Y-C-H-O-L-O-G-Y.com. And you can learn more. We actually have some fabulous videos, and we're getting some more testimonials up there, but there are some from people. And so... If you want to learn more about it, you can listen to the videos, and um, we also have a sneak peek, and so if you're not sure you want to totally commit, you can do that too. Awesome, and so what if somebody want to work, uh, wants to work with you? Can you explain about that? How would they get a hold of you? Yeah, uh, so I have a webpage. It's drnicolecain.com, so D-R-N-I-C-O-L-E-C-A-I-N.com. I work with people around the world. I have patients in London and France and Canada and all around the United States. I do in-person visits in Grand Rapids, Michigan and Scottsdale, Arizona, and I do telemedicine for people who are not able to come and see me locally. Excellent. So what if I already have a doctor, and let's say I live in like california or delaware or like florida or something and i'm like hey this food allergy thing sounds cool like mm -hmm. my doctor doesn't have that one they're just trying to poke me with this like medieval torture device how do i get your food allergy thing yeah, you how do can, i get that you can get that at my webpage, and so the way that works is we pay the lab and then send you a kit and the kit has everything that you would need and we have relationships with labs around the country and so you would go and get a blood draw with the kit that we provide for you and it has the shipping information and so it's super simple you just take the kit to like a lab core request oh, okay and they take your blood and they send it off and then in 10 business days we'll probably get the results back depending on the if they're on time we give you a very comprehensive write-up and recommendations for how to proceed oh very cool i mm -hmm. think i need that one again yeah I absolutely think I need to take that test um Okay, awesome. Well, thanks so much for being our guest. I hope people enjoyed it. And thanks so much, Dr. Nicole Kane, for being on The Intentional Clinician. Thank you. I had a wonderful time. Me too. And that wraps it up. This has been another episode of The Intentional Clinician with Paul Krause. I really enjoyed talking with Dr. Kane. 
And if you want to know more about her, go to www.drnicolecain.com. Or if you want to know more about her book, go to www.gutpsychology.com. And I wanted to just thank everybody who has been rating The Intentional Clinician on iTunes and subscribing and sharing with their friends and family. I really appreciate it. As you know, this is Paul Krause. I am a private practice counselor in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I often am in Arizona as I do consulting work for some behavioral health companies, and also I do trainings. I'm developing a training called The Intentional Clinician, which I've done a few times for some behavioral health organizations. If you'd like to know more about that, just go to my website at www.paulkrauscounseling.com and send me an email or check out my group practice at www.healthforlifegr.com. And for the disclaimer portion, do not make any changes to your diet or anything without first consulting your doctor. While Dr. Kane is a licensed physician in the state of Arizona, you must make sure that you are meeting with your own physician and not trying to treat yourself. If you have any mental health emergencies, please dial 911 or call the National Suicide Helpline. And you can even now chat online with them. Just go to Google and type in National Suicide Prevention Hotline. And while these are the opinions of a doctor and a counselor, these should not be viewed as the definitive opinion on any subject. So if you need treatment of any kind, whether it be mental health treatment or seeing a doctor, please go find a doctor that works for you. All right. Have a great day, everybody. about your favorite meal my favorite meal um i like things that are high in savory flavors like garlic and salt mm, especially if we can get some like baked brussels Ooh, brussels you better not be recording this don't worry about it you are great